This is The Politics of Everything, and I'm your host, Amber Danes. Welcome to the podcast where we want to discuss the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment to equality, and much more. Our guests are experts in their field or topic of choice, even if you've not yet heard their name. This is a bipartisan podcast, so while we love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate, by no means is this a one-sided forum for any one political view. So please listen up and enjoy the politics of everything. Who doesn't love the feeling of walking into a beautifully designed house, hotel or workspace? Interiors can ignite feelings, create memories and even affect how productive we are on an everyday basis. Interior design is something I admire, but admit, I don't really understand so much why some things look so perfect and pretty and amazing, and most of my things don't look like those shiny pin interest worthy shots that we all covet. Today, I'm interviewing Emma Bloomfield, an accomplished stylist and author who has creatively reframed how we view interior design. She's taken her sharp design knowledge to the masses with pragmatic, innovative solutions to living in style, no matter if you're young or old, with or without kids in a luxe mansion or a studio apartment. She's also published a book called Home and runs an online business called The Decorating School aimed at burgeoning stylists and new business owners alike. I almost wish this podcast had a video component as we unpack the politics of interiors here today with Emma. Welcome, Emma. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. So I'm going to dive straight in and ask you how you actually became interested in interior design and what your early career journey was. Well, I actually went to uni and did a business degree and majored in marketing. So I never even studied interior design. So it's actually a miracle that I've ended up in this industry without any experience or qualifications. But the design industry isn't actually regulated for you to need to have studied a degree in interior design. So I was pretty lucky that I could kind of fall into it by getting experience with some amazing people in the industry quite early on in my career. I was one of those kids that was always rearranging their bedroom and annoying mum by rearranging things in the house and secretly had this obsession with, do you remember that video game, The Sims? Yes. Wow. Okay. I know. That's I absolutely loved it. And what I would do was I'd go to realestate.com.au, download floor plans of these mega mansions in the eastern suburbs and North Shore um, in Sydney. And then I would create those floor plans in The Sims. <laughs> That's really geeky, Emma, but I love it. <laughs> and then I would just have all this fun building these amazing houses. I'd never actually play with the humans in The Sims game. I'd be too busy building the houses. That sounds like it was a uh, destiny for you to end up in interior design. You said you've worked with some amazing people to help help you kind of get your knowledge. Mm-hmm. Did they kind of take you on as interns? I mean, what was the career path like in terms of, you know, yeah. getting enough knowledge to feel confident enough to take this on as your own business? It is really hard to get into this industry. So, I was pretty lucky that I was able to work with um, magazines like Real Living and Home Beautiful doing work experience for them just to kind of feel – out where the industry is at, how to kind of get ahead. And it's really about who you know in this industry more than anything else. And I worked with a couple of stylists from those magazines. And then that experience then helped me get into my first job, which was with a high-end interior designer in the North Shore of Sydney. And that's kind of where it all kind of kicked off. So, what I'm hearing is that qualification is not the be-all and end-all to becoming an interior designer. There's many pathways. Mm. Can anyone really learn it? And why or why not do you think that's the case? Yeah, absolutely. I think you do need to have some sort of eye for design and, and that passion behind you, but don't necessarily have to have spent four or five years studying a degree. It depends what sort of path you want to take. If you want to be doing bathroom and kitchen renovations, then yes, you do need to be qualified and you do need to have studied design so that you can do the drawings and that sort of thing. But if you're wanting to do more decorating and styling like I do, you don't necessarily need to have done that at university. There's not really a design degree for soft furnishings and that sort of thing. There's uh, certificates and, and diplomas, but not necessarily a degree. So, you can pick it up on the job. So, it sounds like you have 
based on your knowledge, had enough experience in the industry to set up the decorating school. Tell us a little bit about how you came to set that up and what's the process of teaching people about the world of interiors remotely? Because I imagine a lot of this is online. So it's Mm -hmm. a bit different to be in the same room where we can kind of move things around and, and kind of experience it together. How do you actually come across, you know, being able to teach people in that way? Yeah, I was running workshops in regional and rural uh, towns all across the East Coast. And someday I actually met my business partner, Sonia, and she knew that I was doing these workshops. And she said, I feel like there's a way that we could collaborate. She had a background in digital strategy and operations management and had a huge passion and love for interiors, especially eco interiors. And we kind of got chatting about it and thought, maybe we could take my workshops online uh, and expand them into an e-course that we do through PDFs and videos. And then that kind of morphed into the decorating school, which is now two e-courses and uh, in-person workshops as well. So with the decorating school, where do you start with people? How, if you've got no experience at all, what, what's a, what are some of the basics that you take us through? And then what's at the other end? What's the progression like in terms of some of the mindsets that you need to get people into so they can start to, I guess, apply quite quickly the knowledge that you and your business partner have? Yeah, that's that's something that we found a lot of people actually do come to the course with quite a negative mindset about their home, which I find really upsetting because I see my home as this safe, happy, relaxing, really beautiful space to come home to and feel, you know, safe and secure. But some people just come home and hate everything around them. And I think that's really sad that they, they feel that way. So we try and do a bit of mindset work with them before we actually start the course and reframe how they view their own home. And then over the six weeks, we do some goal setting and, and check back in with their goals across um, the e-course so that we can make sure that we are actually shifting their mindset and getting them into a more positive headspace. That sounds really interesting. And I guess some of the more um, the other skills that you're going to be teaching them are things that I imagine about composition and colour and even the layout of a room and how, you know, different furnishings can change that. Are there rules when it comes to, say, a really large, big, expansive space, which, you know, in some ways I always think of as a little bit easier to decorate versus the economy you need when you've got like a tiny apartment or a small living area and you've got to try and fit in a dining room and other other sort of practical components? What, what are some of the rules around those spaces? I actually like decorating the smaller rooms. <laughs> they have more of a challenge. Um, the larger spaces, you need to get your proportions right. So you need to know what sort of sofa can fit in the space. If you want to do a big modular sofa, then then go really big if you do have the space rather than putting a relatively small sofa in it. It's going to look like it's just floating in a gallery. Um, so knowing your measurements before you actually go shopping is the key to making it work properly. Um, And then other things like rugs are a great way to zone an area, both in small and large rooms, because they'll kind of give an anchor point to the furniture. And then when you're looking at the room as a whole, your eye has somewhere to rest. Um, And the other thing for both uh, small and large spaces is investing in the big ticket items first. So that's things like buying your sofa, your dining table, armchairs and your bed. And then the other pieces will kind of fall together once you've made those big decisions first. That's interesting. So it's funny you say that I have a friend who several years ago was doing the big renovation and when she had someone over that was sort of in in the same field as you are, she was really obsessed with the soft furnishings. She was like, I really love this red pepper mill in my kitchen, for example, (laughs) and I really like, you know, some of these cushions and it it, it sounds like that you need to flip that on its head almost and and kind of start like with the bigger stuff. Why yeah, you is that? Can, you can have a color palette um, by all means. That's probably a great place to start is creating, you know, three to five colors that you want to work with in the space, but then making sure that you have selected your sofa, especially for a living space, because it is such a big piece for the room. That's going to dictate so much of everything else in the room as well. So yeah, working out color palette and then going with the big pieces first saves you a lot of hassle when you do come to the soft furnishings and the finishing touches, because you've kind of already got like a clear idea of where it's headed with all the other purchases that you've made. Excellent advice. It's definitely something I'm, I'm going to tick off when I'm, <laughs> when I'm at that stage. What kind of interiors do you love the most? What are your favourite types and why? 
I have a really varied um, preference in, in styles and I think that's probably a good thing because it means that I don't get bored with clients and it means that I can also test a whole bunch of things out on other people as well. Um, so Spend I'm, their money and not your own. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's much more fun. Um, I really like uh, more like classic styles, like the Hamptons kind of feel uh, rustic country. But then I also really love tribal um, and more eclectic styles too. So I think the biggest thing is making a few styles work together, which you can do because they all borrow elements from each other. It's just a matter of getting those elements right when you do come to mix them together. Yeah, that, that sounds like really good advice in terms of like everyone looking at their space individually too because I, I must admit there's there's lots of often trends that come through and you'd see that a lot in interiors. I have a theory that in your 20s it's all about fashion and in your 30s onwards it's all about interiors in terms of the magazines <laughs> you buy and the, and the blogs you read and the people you follow on social media. It is easy to become a slave to a trend because you see it everywhere and you feel like if you're going to update your house at that point in time, that might be something you might go with. So, a tangible example might be rose gold taps, which have been very fashionable Mm. for a while, or black tap wear, or it could even be, like you say, a certain style like the Hamptons or tribal stuff. How do you actually coach clients to sort of not be a slave to the trends and go with interiors that are going to last the test of time? Because it sounds like – in some ways, those big ticket items are always going to be there and the soft finishings, you don't necessarily want to change every year as well. Like what's the balance? Yeah, I always tell my clients don't don't go for the trendy things in your largest pieces. So, go for more classic choices for those big ticket items and then invest, like you'll invest your money into that and then you've got more of like your pocket money that you would spend on soft furnishings that it doesn't matter if in 12 months' time you look at that fluoro pink cushion and go, why did I do that? I can just get a new one. But if you've got a pink fluoro sofa, it's slightly more expensive to change your sofa. Um, So keep the trendier items to the smaller, more movable pieces. And that way, if you don't like them in three years' time, it's not a huge issue if you want to update those things. That's great advice. In terms of your projects that you have worked with, and I know you've worked with a whole range of things from commercial projects through to individual homes, Mm -hmm. What's one of the projects that you can describe for people that you've taken a really bland space and how you want to transformed it and without the sort of massive budget that obviously if money was no object, it in some ways is easier. What would be an example of something that you've you've transformed on a budget? Um, I'm doing a lot of Airbnb projects at the moment. So they're obviously smaller budgets because they're not living in them. So they don't want to invest in the furniture because they're not there using it day to day. Someone else is using it. So it needs to be sturdy stuff that doesn't matter if it gets damaged um but then obviously doesn't can't be expensive either and they've usually got a really tight turnaround too because the faster you can get it furnished the sooner you can get it on the market and have it rented out so i actually really enjoy doing those airbnb projects because you're doing it for an absolute scratch you're doing it on a relatively small budget and you're doing it really quickly (laughs) that must be a big challenge and i guess like you say those people it has to last the test of time it's almost like a hotel you know it's Mm. the modern version of the hotel That must be interesting. In terms of like other things that you love working on, what are some of the other bigger projects, commercial stuff that you do regularly that you also can share with people? And how how do you go about a project which might have a big budget but also big expectations? Yeah, they're the ones that you feel so much pressure for and I'll end up not sleeping for a week in advance. So um, the things that stress me out the most are events because you kind of only get one shot at styling that. And if you turn up on the day and you haven't got a backup plan for flowers or vases or setting up the table and tablecloths, then you kind of don't really have any other option and you've got to think on your feet. So I do enjoy them because it's really fast paced and the outcome is instant because you're there styling it in the morning and then it's, you know, like a couple of hours of the event and it's done and you've got to pack it down again, which is a bit sad, but I really enjoy the fast paced uh, setup of an event and then seeing that beautiful finished product in one hit because with my design work, it's a bit slower when you're living in the space, you take time with your purchases, you've got to wait for your budget um, and it's a, it's a much slower process. So the events are really fun um, and same with commercial too, because usually they want to get in and start working in the space. So they need to be moving quite quickly with them as well. And the brief I imagine is a bit more specific with the commercial operations as well. Yeah, because usually it's more task orientated for the different areas in the room. Um, but in saying that, quite often there's there's like the staff breakout areas that they can have a bit more fun in. So there's a lot more scope with that as well. 
Interesting. Great to hear that kind of scope of work that you do. What advice do you have for anyone who might be addicted to buying lots of stuff and not necessarily (laughs) editing what they have? Like that idea of decluttering and making your space workable and livable. I know for me personally, that often makes me not like my space when there's too much stuff, but there's also a practical mm. reality that you can't live in a set. You can't live in, in something that, you know, there's no- You can't no, live in a catalogue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, I'd love to, but- <laughs> So would I. You know, family life doesn't dictate that. And also the reality of you've got piles of paper and other things as well. Do you have a process to help people maybe with their interiors? It's not about buying more, but using what they've got and maybe editing and culling. Yeah, this is probably the one thing that I talk to clients about first and decluttering is a huge thing for a lot of my clients and sometimes I think maybe I should just offer a hoarding counselling class and just get them all in and give them a huge lesson in stop hoarding all your stuff and um, I do have a worksheet that I give to some clients. It's a keep or chuck worksheet so I ask them to go through each room of the house that they want to kind of revamp or they've, they've got issues with and I'll just say to them, put post-it notes on the things you want to keep and then um, put like put a green post-it note on what you want to keep and a red post-it note on what you can chuck out. And it's funny, if you don't sit down and do that sort of inventory, quite often you forget that you've got so much stuff in the space and you walk past it, you don't realise it's there and it's not until someone forces you to really look at it and almost like you're looking at the house as an open inspection on the first day of selling that you kind of go, oh, I actually don't need 25% of the things in this room. Um, and yeah, it's quite funny to see once I actually do start thinking about the pieces in the room, what can actually go and what they haven't realized they're holding onto that they don't need to hold on to anymore. Absolutely. And I think there's a psychology in why people hang on to things. And I've even mm-hmm. seen people go to the, to the extent of, you know, psychologists actually saying it actually holds you back in life. If you've got things, which for whatever reason you're having that are no longer serving you. So it does sound like as much as, you know, environment for some people might sound like the superficial stuff, it can actually really change everything like your productivity and your mindset and, mm. and how you feel every day. So I can see the power in that decluttering process. And I guess from there, would you then take them shopping or is it just not always about yeah. that? Um, it depends what they need. So they might still need some key things or they might actually need some storage. And so that's something that we need to go and address. And not everyone has the luxury of built-in storage. So then you've got to find pieces that will work for them. Um, like this morning, I saw a client who has, uh, she works from home a bit, but she doesn't want to have her laptop in a cupboard. She wants to work from another space in, in the dining area. So it's more about adding smart choices to the space and making your storage work really well for you and your family as well because everyone has different needs for the space. Absolutely. I think storage is a big one and it can really Mm. also just getting things off the floor. I remember sort of looking at my spaces in the past and going, they're so cramped. And as soon as we cleared that, you know, get things onto shelves or find homes for it, it does open up your space and you feel less overwhelmed. I think it's that feeling of overwhelm when you're living in a space that's not ideal for you Mm. that people must struggle with as well. Um, Mm, I know you've written a book called Home, which is a fantastic title and tells us everything (laughs) we need to know. But for you, why was doing a book so important and what do you really teach others about that home space? Yeah, the book was actually a really fun project, but I wasn't really expecting to do it relatively early in my career. I thought it would be something I'd do later in life. Um, But as I wrote it, I realized that the 30,000 words in the book actually came out really easily. So, it was an interesting process to realize that I actually did know a lot more than I thought I did. So, sharing the knowledge that I'd learned and also the things that I'd picked up in the workshops that I was running and getting instant feedback from Um, people and how they're living and what they're struggling with was an easy process for me to kind of put together into the book. Um, And then it was sort of this tool that I could give to clients uh, and help them when they are feeling quite negative about their space or they've moved into a brand new home and don't even know where to start. So it's a tool that can help them make changes on their own without necessarily having to call on a designer every time because they can get expensive with a decorator. Um, And a lot of the time they want to have a go at decorating themselves and then have someone that they can come to uh, to ask advice for key decisions for the home, but then ultimately have a good crack at it themselves. 
That's really great. So you're sort of equipping people really to understand their home environment more as well as obviously the some of the interior principles. How mm. many people have you actually worked with over the years? Is it kind of with the, with the decorating school and your individual clients? Would it be the thousands? I mean, how sort yeah, of – Yeah, it would have to be. I don't even know. I should count, but it would be – oh, it would be like 5,000 maybe. <laughs> That's incredible. And how long have you been in your business for? Uh, the business is six years old. Wow, that's amazing. So what's next? What's what's the next stage for the business and, and what you're trying to achieve, Emma? Well, next year we'll be launching a new e-course for the decorating school. So we'll have three e-courses on offer as well as a mentor program for stylists wanting to get into the industry. And the other exciting thing that I'm working on is book number two. Excellent. Well, we, we definitely will look out for that as well. I have two questions I always ask all of my guests mm-hmm. and I would love to – unpack that with you today one is around any special inspirational people in your life that have been significant and they don't have to be famous or even in the same industry but who are they and what have they taught you about success and life um the first that come to mind would have to be my parents um i think most people would probably say that my parents are both very hardworking and ambitious um they're also very intelligent and so they've passed on a lot of those skills to sets to my brothers and i and really, from the very beginning, they've all both said to me, you can do whatever you want to do in life if you just put your mind to it and work really hard. Um, and they've never really held me back from doing anything that I've wanted to do either. So I'm very grateful um, for both of them. And I guess I've had some horrible bosses, so I don't know if they're really inspirational, but they have showed me how not to treat people and how not to run businesses. Um, so I think that's really helpful too. Yeah. The good, the mix of sort of, yes, the, the people that get you to be better because they are not. And I think I've definitely yeah. had those experiences as well. And I think in some ways it's sometimes motivating to keep going in your own business because you do remember you know, what it's like to work with or exactly. for someone Exactly. I remember going to work and feeling sick sitting at work and not being able to eat my lunch because I've been so terrified about what my boss could potentially say to me. So, remembering those feelings when I'm working with other people and more junior stylists, I always think of that. <laughs> Absolutely. And do you find that you do mentor other stylists as well? Do people approach yes. you because you do have obviously a great reputation and, and, and an impressive client list? Do you find that the request- Yeah, I do a lot of mentor work and coaching. So I've got a couple of junior stylists that work for me uh, on the bigger projects that I need installation help with. And then I get uh, a couple of inquiries every week to help um, with it, setting up businesses or just general interiors advice as well. That's great. So it's always good to be able to give back. And, and obviously, you've got a long career yeah. ahead of you, but I think people can always learn. I'm a big believer oh, that you absolutely. can learn both ways. Like you can kind of you know find a mentor but also give back to others as well who might yeah, be you know, on that journey with you. I'd love to wrap up with your top three tips, your best advice for anyone that's keen to master the politics of interiors. The first one is always have a plan. And this is one that we stress so much with the decorating school. And it sounds boring because who wants to sit down and make a plan? It's like running a business plan. You pull that off, you put it off. But honestly, I cannot stress it enough. If you don't have a plan in place, it's all going to fall apart. It's just so vital that you sit down, even if it's just a visual mood board and you create um, a Pinterest board with bits and pieces that you want to add to the room and you can go back and collate those images yourself. Having some sort of reference to keep you on track throughout the process will stop you from making any expensive mistakes along the way. Um, the other thing is it probably won't come together instantly. It's going to take time. A good room does take time. It's not something that you can click your fingers and it's all amazing. And when you're I living like in the space, TV walking, shows, right? Oh my god! Don't get me started. <laughs> they make it look like in a day I can have a whole new kitchen. Oh and yeah, yeah. Exactly. I know. Reality TV is not realistic. So don't believe everything you see on TV. Um, And the third one is don't panic. There's no such thing as a decorating emergency in this industry. I think, you know, sometimes your sofa is delayed, but is it really an emergency to get a sofa in your house? No, you can work with beanbags or another sofa or that sort of thing. So give it time and it will eventually come together and, and, Don't stress too much because that overwhelming feeling is what stops you from actually getting further ahead. So you do need to step back and take another look at it before you keep going. That's great advice. If anyone does want to connect further with Emma or the Decorating School, we'll have some details on our show notes. 
Until next time, keep well. Thanks for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, we thrive on feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network and your friends and family. I'm also always on the hunt for fabulous new guests. So if you've got a view to share and an idea how to get our listeners excited, please email me at amber at bespoke comms, that's B-E-S-P-O-K-E-C-O-M-M-S dot com dot A-U and we'll be sure to get back to you. Until next time.